What if you showed up to play football when you were prepared to play basketball? You've been practicing your basketball game, but you show up and it's a football pitch. It's not going to go well. This is very similar to how we actually build our businesses. We are actually playing with the wrong rules for the game we're actually in. If you have at least one competitor, you have a game. And according to James Carsey, there are two types of games. There are finite games and there are infinite games. A finite game is defined as known players, fixed rules, and an agreed upon objective, like football. There are referees there to manage the rules. We all agree to the rules, and whoever has more points at the end of the game is the winner. There's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end. Then you have infinite games. An infinite game is defined as known and unknown players. New players can join at any time. The game has changeable rules, and the objective is to perpetuate the game, to stay in the game as long as possible. And if you think about it, we are players in infinite games every day of our lives. There's no such thing as winning marriage. It doesn't exist. And if you thought you could win in your marriage, you were no longer married. <laughs> there's no such thing as winning global politics, and there's definitely no such thing as winning business. But if you listen to the language of too many leaders, they talk about being number one, being the best, beating their competition. Based on what? There's no agreed upon metrics, and there's no agreed upon time frames. In other words, we're playing the infinite game of business with a finite mindset. And if you're playing the game with the wrong rules, something happens. When you play an infinite game with, the wrong, with a finite mindset, there's a few very predictable and consistent outcomes. Decline of trust, decline of cooperation, and the decline of innovation. Let me give you a real life example that I experienced of the difference between somebody playing with a finite mindset and somebody playing with an infinite mindset. I spoke at an education summit for Microsoft. I also spoke at an education summit for Apple. At the Microsoft summit, the vast majority of the, of the executives spent the vast majority of their presentations talking about how to beat Apple. At the Apple summit, 100% of the executives spent 100% of their presentations talking about how to help teachers teach and how to help students learn. One was obsessed with where they were going, the other was obsessed with beating their competition. Guess which one was struggling? So at the end of my talk at Microsoft, they gave me a gift. They gave me the new Zune when it was a thing. This was Microsoft's response to the iPod. And this little piece of technology that they gave me was absolutely brilliant. It was fantastic. Uh, it was, the user interface was simple. It was beautifully designed. It worked flawlessly. So at the end of my Apple talk, I'm sharing a taxi with a senior Apple executive. And I couldn't help myself. I just had to stir the pot. So I turned to him and I said, um, Microsoft gave me their new Zune. It is so much better than your iPod Touch. And he looked at me and he said, I have no doubt. And the conversation was over. <laughs> <clears throat> when somebody's playing with an infinite mindset, they know that sometimes you have the better product and sometimes somebody else has a better product. There's no such thing as winning or losing there's no such thing as being the best. There's only ahead and behind. And the goal is not to beat the competition. The goal is to outlast the competition. The only true competitor in the infinite game is yourself. How do we make our products better than they were last, this year than they were last year? How do we make our culture stronger this year than it was last year? How do we help our leaders grow more this year than last year? Everything is compared to ourself. For if we play in the infinite game with a finite mindset, it not only reduces trust, cooperation, and innovation, but it also reduces the lifespan of the company itself. In the 1950s, the average age of a company was about 60 years. Today, that average is 18. 
It is over 40 years less. So which means we have to learn how to lead in the infinite mindset, in the infinite game. We have to learn to embrace an infinite mindset. You're going to need five things. Number one, you're going to have to have a just cause. Number two, you have to have trusting teams. Number three, you need a worthy rival. Number four, you need a capacity for existential flexibility. And number five, you're going to need the courage to lead. Let's talk about the first one, just cause. A just cause is a cause so just that you would willingly sacrifice your own interests in order to advance this cause. That doesn't mean your life, but it means sometimes turning down a better paying job to stay in this job. It might be, mean long business hours, frequent business trips, being away from your family. And even though you may not like these things, they feel worth it because they feel like the work you're doing is contributing to something bigger than yourself, so valuable that you would willingly make these sacrifices in order to see that just cause advanced. One of my favorite is the Declaration of Independence in the United States. Before the settlers had a revolution, they wrote down a declaration of why they wanted their own country, what their just cause was, what they would be pursuing. And in that declaration, they wrote, all men are created equal, endowed with unalienable rights, amongst which include life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It had nothing to do with borders. It had nothing to do with products. It had to do with an ideal that they wanted to live in. And it was worth going to war. It was worth sacrificing their honor, their fortunes, and their lives in order to advance. The revolution was just the finite part. You can win those, you can lose those, that's just the war. But the cause was to advance this ideal. Yes, the revolution was won, but then the real hard work began. And you can see that though the United States will never actually get there, because that's what a just cause is, it's an ideal. You will never actually get there, but you would be willing to die trying. And you can see it. After the revolution was won, shortly after they had the abolition of slavery, shortly after that they had women's suffrage, Shortly after that, they had the civil rights movement. And shortly after that, they had gay rights. And you can see they're trying, trying to get closer and closer and closer to this ideal. The question is, is what purpose does your company exist for? What just cause is it hoping to advance? That if everything went absolutely perfectly, the world would be different than it is now, and your company is devoted to helping to build that world. Because that is what gives the people who work in our company a sense of purpose, that their work has more worth than simply the things they do during the day, that their lives and their work have meaning. You must give your people a just cause that is worth sacrificing for. Two, trusting teams. I went on a business trip to Las Vegas, and they put me up at the Four Seasons, which is a beautiful hotel. And the reason the Four, Seasons, the Four Seasons is a beautiful hotel is not because of the fancy beds, the comfortable beds. Any hotel can buy a fancy bed. It's because of the people who work there. That when somebody says hello to you, you get the distinct feeling that they wanted to say hello, not that they were told to say hello. I was, uh, they happened to have a coffee bar in the lobby. And so one afternoon, I went and bought myself a cup of coffee. And the barista working that day was a young man named Noah. Noah was funny and engaging. And I had way too much fun buying a cup of coffee from Noah. I stood there far longer than anyone should stand there buying a cup of coffee. So as is my nature, I asked Noah, do you like your job? Immediately, he replied, I love my job. Now, in my line of business, that's significant. Like is rational. I like the people I work with, I like the challenge, I get paid well, I like my job. Love is emotional, it's a higher order feeling. You know, do you love your wife? I like her a lot, right? <laughs> it's different. Noah said I love my job, so immediately my ears perk up. I follow up. Tell me specifically what the Four Seasons is doing that you would say to me you love your job. Without skipping a beat, Noah says, throughout the day, managers will walk past me and ask me how I'm doing, ask me if there's anything that I need. 
to help do my job better. Not just my manager, any manager. And then he said, I also work at Caesar's Palace. And there, the managers walk past us and catch us when we're doing things wrong. There, they're just trying to make sure we get everything right, make the numbers. He says, there, I like to keep my head below the radar, just get through the day and collect my paycheck. Only at the Four Seasons do I feel I can be myself. This is the exact same human being, and yet our experience of him would be profoundly different, not because of the person, but because of the leadership. I get this question all the time. Simon, how do we get the most out of our people? People are not a towel. We don't wring them out. How much can we get out of them? The correct question to ask as a leader is how do we create an environment in which our people can work at their natural best? And the answers will be completely different. And we very often blame our people when we have performance issues or customer service issues. But as I just said, it's the exact same human being. The only difference was the quality of the leadership. To be on a trusting team, to create an environment in which trusting teams can exist, mean that the people can come to work and feel safe raising their hand and saying, I made a mistake. I don't feel like I have enough training to do the job that you've asked me to do. You promoted me to a level where I need more help. I'm scared. I'm having trouble at home. It's affecting my work. I need more help. I want to be myself. I can be myself. They can say these things and do these things without any fear of humiliation or retribution. In fact, they do so with the absolute confidence that their colleagues and their leaders will rush to them to support them. This is what it means to be on a trusting team. If you do not have trusting teams in your company, if you are not creating a leadership environment in which trusting teams can exist, what you do have is a group of people who show up to work every single day lying, hiding, and faking. They're hiding mistakes. They're pretending that they can do a job that they don't know how to do. They're not going to ask for help. They definitely don't feel like they can be themselves. And eventually, things will start to crack, and eventually, they will break. And it will be the fault of the leaders. We've seen this play out. We know what this looks like in the extreme. I'm sure you all remember a few years ago in the United States, United Airlines pulled a passenger off their aircraft with a broken nose, broken teeth, and a concussion. I feel sorry for every member of that crew because every single member of that crew knew what the right thing to do was but did not intervene because they feared getting in trouble more than doing the right thing. This was not an anomaly. This, was not, this did not happen overnight. This was built up over years of no trusting teams. I saw it years before I saw clues. I was getting ready to board a United Airlines aircraft, and a scene played out in front of me where one of the passengers attempted to board the plane before their group number was called, which, as everybody here knows, is a serious crime. <laughs> and that was how the gate agent treated him. Step aside, sir. I haven't called your group yet. Please step aside and wait till I call your group, is how she talked to a paying customer. So I spoke up. I said, why do you have to talk to us that way? Why can't you talk to us like we're human beings? And she looked me in the eye and said, sir, if I don't follow the rules, I could get in trouble or lose my job. What she told me was, what, she, well, what, I, what I could hear was, that she does not feel safe in her own company, and her leaders do not trust her to do the job for which she's been trained to do. And guess who suffers? Company, customer, and her. The reason we've loved flying airlines like Virgin is not because they have some magical formula to hire the best people. It's because the people who work there feel safe to do their jobs. They feel like their leaders trust them to do the job for which they've been trained to do. And guess who benefits? Customer, company, and all the employees. We have a responsibility as leaders to create an environment in which our people can feel like they can be themselves and they can work to their natural best and feel safe when they need help. That's what it means to be a trusting team. You must have trusting teams 
if you want to play in the infinite game. Number three, worthy rival. There's another guy who does what I do. He writes books, he gives talks like this one. He's exceptionally good at what he does. He's extremely well respected. I hate him. <laughs> He's always been very nice to me when I've seen him at conferences. I hate him. And I will go online and I will check his book ranking and then I will immediately check mine. I don't check anybody else's, just his. And if I'm ahead, I'm smug. And if he's ahead, I'm angry. I want to beat him. We were invited to speak at the same conference, and I don't mean like me in the morning, him in the evening. I mean like on the stage at the exact same time. We were going to be interviewed together. And the interviewer thought it would be fun <laughs> if we introduced each other. So I went first. I turned to him and I said, um, you make me really insecure. I said, all of your strengths are all of my weaknesses. And when your name comes up, I get uncomfortable. He looked at me and he said, uh, funny, I feel the same about you. <laughs> the reason I had so much anger towards him the reason I was so competitive with him is because his strengths revealed to me my weaknesses. And it was much easier for me to direct that energy against him than it was to take a hard look at myself. That's the value of a worthy rival. Competitors are people we want to beat, we want to win. But the problem with that is this game has no finish line. It's like running in a race and we're so driven to beat our competitors that we would trip them, we would resort to anything to win. The problem is we may win the race, but we're still a slow runner and there's gonna be another race and another race and another race. There is no finish line in this game. And so when we have that kind of competitive energy, it actually hurts us. If we take on this new idea that we no longer have competitors, we now have worthy rivals, and a worthy rival is another player in the game that is worthy of comparison. Sometimes they can be in your industry and sometimes not, but they have a strength. They are actually better at things than you are. Maybe their products are better. Maybe their customer service is better. Maybe their website is better. Maybe their culture is better. Maybe their leaders are stronger. And instead of being angry about it, we thank them. We're grateful that their strengths reveal to us our weaknesses so we know where we have to work. Because remember, the only true competitor in the infinite game is ourselves. If we truly think we're the best, that makes us blind to our weaknesses. Remember MySpace? They had no clue. They thought they were the... 800 pound gorilla, until Facebook showed up. That's called blind. You can have a worthy rival in your own office. We have these little competitive things sometimes at work where we hear that one of our colleagues gets a promotion and we get mad. They don't deserve it. I deserve it. <laughs> it's like Gollum. <laughs> or we can admire them. They're good, they're great leaders. They command respect and loyalty in a way that I don't. And instead of hating them because it makes me feel insecure, I'm gonna commit myself to become a better version of myself. You get to choose your own worthy rivals. Make sure they challenge you. Make sure they work. Make sure they push you to be a better version of yourself. And when they drop out of the game, you find another one. Back in the day, Apple's worthy rival was IBM. IBM was the Navy, and Apple were the pirates. And then they fell out of the game. Then it was Microsoft. Microsoft was the Navy, and Apple were the pirates. Then they fell out of the game. And these days, maybe it's Facebook or Amazon. But once again, Apple uses these worthy rivals to make them, to push them to be even better. Who are your worthy rivals? Learn from them, push yourself. Number four, you have to have a capacity for existential flexibility. What does that mean? This is not about the daily flexibility that you have to have in business. Existential flexibility is big. It's the willingness to profoundly change course 
at great personal expense to the company because it's the right thing to do to advance your just cause. I'll give you two examples. There's a classic example. Back in 1979, Apple was already a big company. Steve Jobs was already a famous CEO. They were already well-known and doing quite well. And Apple had a just cause. It was to empower individuals to stand up to Big Brother. They loved the idea that we as individuals could compete with a corporation. And that's why they were so drawn to the personal computer. Because clearly this device could give individuals great power. Jobs and a bunch of his senior executives went on a tour of Xerox Park, which was Xerox's R&D division. And while they were there, Xerox showed them a new invention called the graphic user interface that they had invented. This gave us the ability to move a cursor over the desktop to click on icons to work the computer as opposed to having to learn a whole computer language. They leave Xerox and Jobs sees this graphic user interface thing and he says to his, his executives, we have to invest in that. That will help us advance our cause and give even more people more power to use these computers to stand up to Big Brother, compete with corporations. The voice of reason in the room said, Steve, we can't. We can't do that. We've already invested millions of dollars and countless man hours in a different strategic direction. If we walk away from that, we will blow up our own company. To which Jobs actually said, better we should blow it up than someone else. That decision became the Macintosh, a computer operating system so profound that it's literally changed the way computers exist in our lives. In fact, the entire software of Windows is designed to act like a Macintosh. That is existential flexibility, that you find a better way to advance your cause, that if you stayed on the path you're on, eventually it's going to run out and you're going to go out of business. That's what happens. If you don't blow up your own company to advance the cause, the market will blow it up for you. George Eastman, the founder of Kodak, he had a just cause. He wanted to democratize photography. Prior to George Eastman, the only way that we could take pictures is we had to hire a professional photographer. And because of George Eastman, he invented film it allowed the rest of us to take pictures ourselves. You didn't have to learn how to coat big metal plates with chemicals. It took hours and it was expensive and heavy and dangerous. And photography took off. And the company was obsessed with making photography cheaper and simpler and cheaper and simpler for all of us. And in 1975, one of their scientists, a man by the name of Steve Sasson, invented the digital camera. And the executives at Kodak suppressed the technology because they feared that it would cannibalize film sales. They couldn't bring themselves to imagine a digital world. They couldn't bring themselves to recognize that they had to go through this upheaval to go from a film company and a chemical company and a paper company into a digital company. And they knew that this digital thing would catch on in about 10 years, and sure enough, Almost to the year, 10 years later, digital showed up in the rest of our lives. In fact, Kodak made billions of dollars from the royalties they made from the patents they had. Then the patents ran out, and five years later, they went bankrupt. Because if you're not willing to blow up your own company, the market will blow it up for you. They didn't have the strength to say, we have to make this change even though it's going to hurt. And I call it a capacity for existential flexibility because you do not have the capacity for existential flexibility until you have a just cause because otherwise it's just random shiny object stuff. Or two, that you don't have trusting teams because you're going to put your company through unbelievable stress and the people better know why you're doing it because they agree with the move and they're willing to suffer in the short term because it's the right thing to do to advance the cause. We're in. Let's do this. Every company that goes through an existential flex, like Apple becoming the Macintosh, put the company through hell, and it was worth it. And if you don't have to do it in your tenure, you may never have to do it as the leader of your company, but is your company prepared to do it for the leader who takes over after you? You have to prepare your company for existential flexibility if you want to stay 
in the infinite game. If you want your company to die when you quit, then ignore everything I'm telling you. Number five, you have to have the courage to lead. This may be the hardest one of all because everything that I have explained to you today is unbelievably difficult work. Making decisions that are the right decision to make to advance your cause, which sometimes means turning down more money from someone else, is hard to do. Building trusting teams is unbelievably difficult. It's not an event. You don't just have a company offsite. It's a lifestyle. It's the difference between having children and being a parent. Having children takes like five minutes, <laughs> if you're lucky. Raising children takes a very long time. Getting a promotion and becoming, uh, earning a leadership position takes five minutes. Your boss says, you're promoted. Yeah. Go out for dinner, celebrate. Being a leader is unbelievably difficult and it's a completely new lifestyle. It means putting my interests aside to create an environment in which my people can work to their natural best. It's being invested in the growth of others. It's sometimes lonely and thankless. Sometimes you don't get immediate results. It's like going to the gym. You go to the gym, you come back, you look in the mirror. What do you see? Nothing. You go to the gym the next day, you come back, you look in the mirror. What do you see? Nothing. But you commit yourself. You commit yourself to the lifestyle. That if I work out every single day for 20 minutes, I know with 100% certainty I will get into shape. I don't know when. And that's the problem. Because in the finite game, we like to predict. We like to guess our results, and we like to predict when they're going to happen. In the infinite game, the results are 100% certain. I just can't tell you exactly when they're going to happen. It's good to have goals. There are finite games within the infinite game. There are wins within the, in, within the infinite game. The infinite game is the context within which those finite games exist. Those finite games exist to advance a cause bigger than ourselves. That's hard. Building a company for existential flexibility and then actually going through it, hard. Having to look at our competitors, but then really look at ourselves and admit that we suck and then have to work on it, oh. So much easier to just spend more money on advertising. <laughs> hard. It's easy to write your purpose on your website. It's really hard to actually make decisions based on your purpose. Hard. All of these things are hard. Not to mention all the pressures that we're all under. The overwhelming amount of pressure that we have, either it's the incentive structure inside our companies that are telling us, make the numbers by the end of the year, make the numbers by the end of the year, think short term, think short term, be selfish, be selfish. Those are the pressures upon us. If you work for a public company, oh my God, even worse. The pressures on us in this modern day and age are overwhelming for us to maintain a finite mindset. The courage to lead means I will reject that mindset, and I'll embrace a new mindset, even though I may feel that I am in the minority. And here's the irony. We've been suppressing these feelings for a long time. We keep being told that we're naive. You don't understand how business works. We feel like we're in the minority, but in reality, we are the majority. We have all worked for people, or sometimes, if we own the company ourselves, felt this is uncomfortable. This, this doesn't feel right. I'm going to do the decision. It makes it makes sense on paper, but it doesn't feel right. That might just be because we're playing by the wrong rules for the game that we're actually in. Just because something's normal doesn't mean it's right. It was a while ago that everybody thought the world was flat until we realized it's not. The business world is not finite. Why are we playing by finite rules? This all raises a very interesting question. What does it mean to live an infinite life? Clearly, our lives are finite. We're born, we die. But life is infinite. The game of life is infinite. There's no winner of life. The game will continue with us or without us. Like business will continue with you or without you. It doesn't care if you go bankrupt or not. That means every single one of us has a choice how we live our lives. Do you want to live by finite rules or do you want to live with an infinite mindset? Living our lives with a finite mindset means we're trying to make more money than anybody else. We want to advance ourselves higher than all our friends. We want to be the biggest. We want to be the best. We're going to be the strongest. And when we die, you don't take any of it with you. The 
choice to live with an infinite mindset means you commit to see that the people around you will carry on your ideas without you, and you will have a profound and positive impact in their lives, that one day in the future, I can go up to any of them and say, how did you become so wonderful? And they will say your name. I am who I am today in part because of you. You will literally live on beyond your own life. You will literally live an infinite life. It is just a choice. We get to choose how we want to live our lives. We get to choose how we want to run our businesses. It's not a question of right or wrong. It's just a choice to play by the rules for the game that we're actually in or not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Simon Sinek, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. I promised inspiring and we delivered. Now, uh, we've got plenty of time for questions and, uh, and Simon, you've got plenty of tea there, so I feel like we're set. Um, I've got some questions here, but if there's some live ones on the catch box, look at this right up here in the front row. Hands are going up. So uh, let's, let's, let's toss the, uh, the catch box up here. Or you can just tell me and I can repeat it. Yeah, and he'll repeat okay. it. That, let, let, tell me your question. Uh, my name is Jennifer, and my question is, what do you think um, the number of women in the company? So the question was, why is it hard for people to play with, the, play with an infinite mindset? Um, there's a few reasons. Um, one is um, uh, the way that we think business works is we think it's finite. Like, remember, we use sports analogies all the time in business, but sports is finite. The wrong, the wrong analogies. We use war analogies, launches and you know campaigns, right? They're all finite, right? So, and we teach finite mindset in business schools, and we treat people as a cost, and. Uh, then you add in incentive structures that don't even recognize the existence of the infinite game, and what you get is normalization. I think the biggest reason, quite frankly, goes back to the 1970s. There's a guy by the name of Milton Friedman, who was an economist, who theorized that the responsibility of business uh, is to maximize profit within the bounds of the law. What about ethics? The law is a very low standard. <laughs> And we see this all the time. We see companies doing very uncomfortable things, and when they have to be testify in front of you know, government officials, they always say the same thing. We follow the law. That means if you have a long-term boyfriend or girlfriend, and they catch you cheating, they say, you can't be mad at me. We're not married. I broke no laws. Yeah, but that's a little unethical, don't you think? Right? But that's basically what we're saying. And you have leaders like Jack Welch in the 1980s and 90s who popularized Milton Friedman's thinking, where we put the, the desires of the shareholder ahead of the, the uh, ahead of the customer or the employee, where you have new theories to balance the books, like using mass layoffs on an annualized basis, which did not exist prior to the 1980s. And things like rank and yank, where we promote our top 10 percent of performers and fire a bottom 10 percent of performers. All of these theories that were popularized in the 80s and 90s have been very, very bad for business and very, very bad for, for uh, capitalism. And we see it. We see this mass rebellion around the world against capitalism. There's nothing wrong with capitalism, except we've broken it. Capitalism, as Adam Smith envisioned it, puts the people, puts the employee first. It puts the customer first. He couldn't imagine a time like this. We broke capitalism. Yes, we should be angry at the capitalism we have, and it's time to go back to a people-focused capitalism, because that's what makes capitalism work better. But all of the incentive structures and the education, and what we're used to for the past 30 years, is all finite thinking. Education, mindset, and the rejection of, uh, of, of Milton Friedman and Jack Welch. Jack Welch wrote a book called Winning. No such thing! Yeah. It would be a, be a terrible thing if a, a president of the United States valued winning above all other things. It no. would be um, uncomfortable. <laughs> it would be, That'd be an awful, very uncomfortable. What an awful... But you know, but you know it's, a, it's a symptom. 
whether, whether it's the president or the CEO of a, a multinational corporation, there's symptoms. We've been marching down this path for a long time. It's not an anomaly, just like United Airlines was not an anomaly. We have ourselves to blame, right? And, and though the United States may be extreme in many ways, uh, I don't think they're unique. Uh, and it, we have ourselves to be, we've been embracing this thinking, we've been the finite thinkers, we've been the ones who are quick to judge and slow to listen. It, it's just, this is what we get. Fair enough. Uh, there is a question that someone wrote in, now they've been anonymous about it, so I, I will respect your privacy, uh, because I have no other choice. Um, <laughs> on, on personal leadership, how do leaders take care of their own health, family, and personal space while leading teams? The question of the, the selflessness of leadership. Yeah. <coughs> it's hard. <coughs> I, I wish I could give you a better answer. Um, uh, there, I, I do not subscribe. Do you know uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. A lot of people use Maslow, you know, when they build their businesses. There's a problem with Maslow, um, which is he ignores the fact that there's a paradox to being human. Uh, we are at every moment of every day living a paradox. We are at every moment of every day inherently, we are individuals and we're members of groups. And every day we're forced to make decisions. Should I put myself first ahead of the group or should I put the group first ahead of myself? And people debate it. No, 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 you have to take care of the group because they'll take care of you. No, 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 you have to take care of yourself because if you're not healthy, how can you take care of your group? You're both right and you're both wrong. It's not one or, it's a paradox. And we have to deal with those stresses every day. Milgram, I mean, uh, Maslow only considered us as individuals. So his, pro his bottom line was, was food and, and, and security, food and, uh, uh, and shelter. And the third line up was social connection. I've never heard of anyone committing suicide because they were hungry. People commit suicide because they're lonely, which means social connection is probably more important than food to some degree, again. Well, yeah, well, yeah, but you have to be fed first. I, yes, I know. It's a paradox. <laughs> I get it. So to answer the question, it's unbelievably difficult. And if you only put yourself first and your team sees you always putting yourself first, you will not come on trust or loyalty. In fact, what will happen is they will put themselves first. And that's going to be your corporate culture. Uh, it is difficult. And sacrifices need to be made. Everybody has the capacity to be a leader. Like everybody has the capacity to be a parent. Doesn't mean everybody should be a parent. Doesn't mean everybody wants to be a parent. Same with leadership. Not everybody wants to be a leader. Not everybody should be a leader because you're gonna make personal sacrifices on both sides. Your family will be sacrificed at times to do the right thing for your people. And sometimes you're gonna have to sacrifice your people to do the right things for yourself. It's unbelievably difficult. But if your family feels that you have their back, they'll be supportive when you make those sacrifices. And if your people feel that you have their back, genuinely, then they'll be supportive when you make those sacrifices. Uh, there's another question right up front. If there's questions in the back, don't, don't <coughs> let us only ask the VIPs question. You guys are important too. Um, but you do have to get the attention of the fellas with the ties and the boxes. And then, Simon, I'll just, uh, just so you know, you sure. can poke down there. If you see any favorite questions, you can take them. Who's my worthy rival? <laughs> it's always, <laughs> you'd like to know. <laughs> You're anonymous. Why don't you tell me who you are, and then I'll tell you who the worthy rival is. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Ted said, what should a young leader do, think, to serve the team that got more life experience? Oh, so what if you're a younger leader and the people have more? Oh, that one's easy. Tell them that you're young and they know more and you need their help. <laughs> All right, now, now and, and that you will commit your, everything you can do to support them and see that they're, they can work at their natural best. Now, now we've got the question up front, but you were just on your phone. What were you doing there? <laughs> what was going? Looking at my She's question. She's taking notes. All right, that's excellent. Well done then. What's, uh, what's your question? Uh, my question is a bit long, but what I want to know is I come from Blink Startup and we inspire people by helping them with business and uh, investing in their dreams and ideas. And uh, we believe that everyone has the same rights, but not the same resources. So what I want to know is how can we inspire people to invest in the no-go zone areas, the, like for connections and stuff? Well, I think that... Uh... The, the, I think the biggest thing, when people don't understand something, they stay away from it. 
right? We resist things that are unfamiliar. Exactly. And if you look at any traditionally warring peoples or people that have tension, it's largely because they don't know each other, right? Or they refuse to listen to each other. We love to talk, but we, we're not very good at listening. So I, I, I'm a big fan of exchanges. Go visit people. You know, you talk to any peace negotiators in the world, you talk to, it's always when, when our enemies, we crossed each other's borders and went to spend time in each other's countries, and we discover that, oh my God, they're just like me. They have the same challenges, they have the same stresses, um, they have the same fears and anxieties, they want the same things for themselves and for their children. It's all kind of the same. And as soon as we can relate to someone and see them as human, and see them as equal, then I think it opens up much more. Um, so I, I, I think, how do we get people to come visit these zones, and how do we take some people from those zones and bring them out to meet others? I think the more that we can, and you know, yes, websites are handy and videos are great, and spreading little movies are helpful. Absent the real life human connection, it's helpful. But if you can get somebody to meet somebody and say, oh my God, they're wonderful, they will tell more people and will trust them more than any kind of video. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's, let's get a catch box uh, to somebody in the back. So if you've got a back, get this fellow's attention. And while that's happening, I'm going to ask you this question, also from anonymous sources. Yep. Uh, what is your best advice about how to empower a team? Uh, what's your best advice to get into shape? Uh, I don't know. Like, you eat well, uh, go to the gym, make sure you have good sleep, nurture your personal relationships. Well, should I start with my arms or my legs? I just start. I don't know. Right? So this is the problem with these kinds of things, which is which is there's no, if I, there's no five things you have to do that will work. Like, what does it take to get somebody to fall in love with me? Well, uh, you have to remember their name. <laughs> Try saying good morning to them before you check your phone. Um, when they want to say, when they want to talk to you, turn off the television and talk to them. If they had a really bad day and you had a really amazing day, don't talk about your day at all, just listen to their bad day. But if you only do these things, they're not going to fall in love with you. And this is the problem with these, these kinds of questions, which is we all want, what are the five things? What are the seven things? And you'll do all those things, and it won't work. And the problem is it's the difference between consistency and intensity, right? You cannot go to the gym and get in shape if you go to the gym for nine hours. It just won't work. But if you work out every day for 20 minutes, it 100% will work. In other words, it's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of little things. It's consistency. It's brushing your teeth every day for two minutes. What does brushing your teeth do for two minutes? Nothing. Unless you do it every single day, twice a day. Can I take a night off if I'm too tired? Yes. <laughs> How many nights can I take off? I don't know. Just don't take off too many. <laughs> it's exactly the same thing. So it's little things. Like when you see someone, you make eye contact with them, and you ask them how they're doing, and you actually care about the answer. And when you have a meal with somebody, there is never, ever a cell phone on a table when you're having a meal. You should ban cell phones in conference rooms. You want to know why? Because it makes people feel like you actually care about them. Can I, can I borrow your phone for one second? Let me show you. What if I were to stand up here and give my talk while holding a phone? I'm not checking it. It's not buzzing. It's not beeping. I'm just holding it. Do you feel like you're the most important thing to me right now? No, you do not. There's a subconscious reaction to the device. So when we come into a meeting, we put our phone on the table, it sends a subconscious message to everybody in the room that you're just not that important to me right now. And putting it upside down is not more polite. <laughs> because we have this anxiety the whole time that things are coming in. And you see people, they look. They just look. That's a very interesting point, Tad. Never, ever, ever should there be a device on any kind of meal table because you're telling the other person, there are other things in the world that I would rather be doing than be right here. Thank you. Right? Absolutely. We do, we do have a question in the back, and I just want to say I have this, but look, it's notes about, it's the questions. I, it's helping <coughs> me work with you better. Uh, who, uh, let's, let's hear the question, and give us your name, too. Hey, Jonas, so I'm, I'm not an anonymous. Who, who was the rival? <laughs> <laughs> I, where is, where, I, what? He's over there. Oh, who was my worthy rival? He just, he just identified who was, himself uh, as that, that was oh, my that's question. <laughs> You've asked too many questions already. There are like so many questions here from anonymous. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard to spell Jonas in there. Yeah, it's fair. Yeah. Hey, uh, how, uh, it, was, it was Adam Grant. 
thank you. But that was my question. <laughs> okay. Thanks for com coming to Stockholm, by the way. Um, how many whys can you have? A wives. How many wives? How many wives can you have? You did. You did. <laughs> you do. You do make a lot of marital references. So I think it's a fair misconception. I don't. I don't know the laws in Sweden. <laughs> uh, but you'd be winning if you had one. Uh, uh, you can have one why. You can have one and only one for the rest of your life. Um, the difference between a why and a just cause is a why comes from the past. We are the sum, it is basically an origin story. We as individuals are the sum total of how we were raised. The lessons we learned, the experiences we had when we were children made us who we are. And our, our, who we are is fully formed by our mid to late teens. That's it. And the rest of our lives simply offers, offer us an opportunity to live in balance with who we truly are. That's it. And same with a company. Your why was formed at the founding of the company. You can destroy the why at a company, absolutely, and the company will probably go sideways and disappear, and then either if a new leader comes in, they have to, there's sort of a rebirth, a renaissance. But as individuals, we all only have one, and it cannot be changed. Tragedy doesn't change it. Tragedy sometimes illuminates it. And uh, there's nothing you can do to change who you are. Uh, like I said, the question is, are you living in balance with your why? If you're a bastard and nobody likes you, odds are you're probably not living in balance with your why, but you're not going to change who you are. And you'll probably be a happier person if you live in, in, in balance with your why too, but you only have one. I, I, Simon, that makes me want to turn to uh, Marie, who asks, and she kind of gutsily thinks it's a question you've never heard before, uh, what is, no, that's not the one. Uh, what, is, uh, what is your why? What is your why? I've highlighted the wrong, there it is. My why is to inspire people to do the things that inspire them. So together, each of us can change our world for the better. It is the foundation of everything I do. It is who I am. Um, my just cause, so that's where I come from. Where am I going? So what does that mean? I have this why, where am I going with it? My, my just cause is to create a world in which the vast majority of people wake up every single morning inspired, feel safe at work, and return home fulfilled at the end of the day. And I'm committed tirelessly to help build that world and I believe leaders are the best people, the best bet we have to build that world. So I've committed myself to find, um, to guide, and to uh, uh, engage with the leaders who I believe are more likely to build that world, which is why I do conferences like this, because I need you. I need you. I need you to build your companies in a way that is consistent with the, with the, the, the mindset of the infinite game. I need you to build your companies where we create circles of safety that our people feel safe to be themselves at work. I, I need you to build companies that start with why. Like, I need you because I want to live in that other world and I cannot do it alone. I need you. That's why I'm here. Fantastic. Wow. Here's a question over here. Yeah, my, my one regret is I didn't save that for last. So I spoke at the Nordic Business Forum in Helsinki four years ago. This nice gentleman was there. Um, and he said, how do I think we've progressed in the past four years since then? Um, I think mixed bag. You know, <laughs> some stuff has clearly gone a little sideways. You know, the, the, the finite mindset is still the majority mindset in how we lead our nations and how we definitely lead our companies. And we're seeing it, we saw it with Brexit. I mean, we see it in various forms. It's all finite mindedness, right? Um, and and it is a result of 30 or 40 years of finite-minded leaders creating systems and promoting finite mindedness until these things build and break. And I think we're in a period right now of, of a, a lot of cracks and breaking that, that are not because of today. They've been building up over 30 and 40 years. Um, and so we have to suffer through this period of upheaval. Um, but to balance that off, uh, we have conferences like this. We're having conversations about purpose. We're having conversations where we talk about putting people before profit. We're having conversations about mindfulness 
and you're not considered crazy to say that out loud on a stage. You're not considered a nut job if you say, I want to build a company that stands for something more than the products we make. So the point is, I think the momentum to change the way the things are is on our side. You know, uh, uh, th this, this message is spreading, and these events are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and the books that are promoting these ideas are selling more and more and more. In other words, there's demand. We want these things. We know the system that we're in is broken. But unfortunately, we are the ones that have to do the work to fix it. And, and right now, the dam is leaking, and we can't point to the dam and say, well, it's broken. I know, but we're up there fixing it. But we're going to get wet. We're going to get wet for a while. You've got, a, uh, you've got one back there. All right, let's, let's catch box it up. Hi, Simon. Hi. My name's uh, Anne. I'd like to ask, based off of your previous question, that Adam what Grant. was... Pardon? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, what was or were defining moments that allowed you to find your meaning or why and become the thought leader that you are now? Uh, the, the simple answer is pain. Uh, I fell out of love with my own work many, many years ago. And it was traumatic. Because superficially, my life was good. I owned my own business, made a decent living, did amazing work, had amazing clients, but I didn't want to wake up and go to work every day. I hated it. But I kept it a secret because I was embarrassed. And so all of my energy went into pretending that I was happier, more successful, and more in control than I felt. That is not a good way to live a life. Um, what made it more complicated is people gave me stupid advice. Do what you love. Thank you. <laughs> I'm doing the same thing, and I don't love it anymore. Nothing's changed. Follow your bliss. Got it. Like, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? You know? Um, and so it wasn't until a dear friend of mine came to me and said, I'm worried about you. Something's wrong. Something's different. And I came clean. I told her exactly what I was going through. And it was that supportive environment that made me feel safe to come clean, and a weight was lifted off my shoulders, and all of the energy that I was using to lie, hide, and fake every day could be used to invest in uh, finding a solution. And the solution that I found was this thing called the why. I knew what I did, and I knew how I did it, but I didn't know the why. And it was based on the biology of human decision making. It was not my opinion. This was how people work. I had to find that out. I became obsessed about it. It's all I talked about. It's all I wanted to talk about. And I shared it with my friends. My friends started making crazy life changes. They invited me to their homes to share it with their friends. So I literally started by standing in somebody's living room talking to a room of people sitting on the floor of a living room. That's how it started. And people just kept in asking me, and I would help people find their why, why for $100 on the side. <laughs> True story. <laughs> My work is all semi-autobiographical. It's all my own struggles, all of it. All the books that I write are about me. Uh, and the, th the, the things that I'm struggling with and the solutions that I find to those struggles. And when I find a solution, I share it with my friends. And when my friends say, wow, this is really powerful, then I think about writing it down and sharing it with others. Uh, so, and the reason my work resonates with other people is because my journey is not unique. I, we all struggle to wake up in the morning without, we want to have purpose. And I wrote Leaders Eat Last because we want to be trusted and trusting. Like, we want to feel safe. We want to feel that somebody's got our backs. We all want that. That's not unique. That's human. And the reason I'm writing The Infinite Game is because I got tired of people telling me that I'm naive and I don't understand how business works and I'm stupid. It, I mean, I started to believe them. And then it occurred to me, what if they're all wrong? <laughs> 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 Simon, a lot of uh, you, you, we were, a lot of this, the, your talk uh, is focusing on building companies and treating your companies, but we've got a question about someone who sort of sounds like they're in the middle of the company, and I don't think they want a you know five step list. But what do you do if you're playing the if you play the infinite game and it seems like the company wants to play it too, but you've got senior leadership that can't quite get on board? Are there any? Oh, very common, very common. Uh, that's more common than not. Middle management is the most difficult position, right? Because remember, infinite is, is context for finite, right? So you frontline staff, it is largely a finite game. Like, 
when there's somebody working as a gate agent at an airline, <laughs> you want them to get the flight out on time. And then it's over. Yeah. It's a finite game. Beginning, middle, end. Right? But you want them to at least be aware of the infinite. Because that way they'll treat the customers nicely because they know that they want them to come back again. It's not just about finite. That's why you can tell a salesperson who's obsessed with a finite game and has no concept of the infinite game, it's sell, 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 sell. They don't care if they're nice to you or not as long as they get the sale. That's stupid. But as you make your way through the ranks, when you get to the most senior position, you have to now be obsessed with the infinite game, but you have to be aware of the finite game because you're going to make decis decisions that will affect the rank and file. So there, the, 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 the weight shifts. The worst position is right here in the middle because you have to balance both and you have to be uh, conversant in both. And most things break, not at the top and not on the bottom. Most things break because of the middle. Uh, and so when, you have, when you're an infinite-minded player and your boss is a finite player, do not hate them. Do not blame them. Have empathy for them. Remember, we don't know where they worked before. We don't know what conditions in, that they worked in before. We don't know how they were beaten down. Remember that they've made it through the ranks. They've made it to their position following the finite rules of the game. And so when you tell them you have to change, why would they change? Like what got me here worked just fine. Now, they're ignoring the fact that it's, they're, they're highly stressful. They, they struggle with trust. They may not sleep well. Like, all of those things that cause personal stress are usually because we're playing by the wrong rules for the game we're in. That's why you would be stressed. It is stressful. So have empathy. Care about them. Worry about them. Concern yourself with them. Go to them. Help them. Offer them. And they will start to see that maybe, maybe, maybe there's a different way of thinking about it. But you can only lead a horse to water. You know, if somebody just refuses to come, then just back off. You know, you, they have to want to make the shift themselves. They have to want to make the shift themselves. The single, this is my friend George Flynn always says, the, single, the first thing to become a leader is you have to want to be a leader. Like, if you don't want to be one, then there's nothing I can do. So, you know, there's a funny, there's a funny joke. How many, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? One, but the light bulb has to really want to change. <laughs> Same thing. Somebody has to want to change. But we have to have empathy, empathy for them. So practice being an infinite person, that circle of trust that you build, you don't, you don't have to be the senior person to build it. You can build it for somebody who's more senior than you. Make them feel safe. I think we've got time for one more question, so let's make it a great one. The pressure's on, and look at these hands, they're waving. Can we, can we get a catch box over uh, there? That's what I meant. Or not. I meant there. Sorry. I was, I, he'll email. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Marcus. Uh, are you happy? Me? Yes. Are you happy with what you're doing right now? Are you, are you being fulfilled? Do you, do you think that your work will change the world? A quick yes and we go right over There's here. There's a lot of questions there. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, I'm good. <laughs> All right, let's get let's let's let's, uh, let's get that catch box over there. There's like eight people that want this question asked. I hope it's a marriage proposal. Uh, name is Anna Sanborn, and uh, I have coached uh, 100 leaders last year to find their why, and I have been assigned to coach uh, 90 next year. And not many, but a few have shown resistance in finding their why as leaders, and I would just like to ask you what you would give for advice to me. Uh, how do you meet people when they're scared? I have a rule. When I help people find their why, they have to ask me. I won't do it until they ask. I'll say it to somebody. I'm like, I'll help you, I'll do it. The answer is yes, but I'm not gonna do it until you ask. I'm not gonna take accountability. I'm not gonna force my views upon you. They have to want to go willingly. And so if, a long, long time ago, before uh, uh, I, I was in the early days of me preaching the why, and sort of word was starting to spread, I was doing sort of consulting for small businesses to help them find their why. And I obey the law of diffusion of innovations. I don't know if you know the law of diffusion real quick. So real simple, right? All populations sift across the standard deviation, the old bell curve, right? 
you have high performance, you're gonna have low performance, right? And you're gonna have an average, you're gonna have a mean, right? What the law of diffusion says is the first two and a half percent are our innovators, the next 12 to 13 percent are our early adopters, the next 34 percent are your early majority, late majority, and the last 16 percent are your laggards. We want to have a, an impact in the mass market, we want to change the world. But what the law of diffusion tells us is that you cannot have mass market success or mass market acceptance of an idea until you achieve between 15 and 18% market penetration. This is the tipping point, social phenomenon. So what I learned at a very early uh, point in my career, I became obsessed with this. This is religion to me. And so I only wanted to do business with these people. Because these people, yes, they're nice people, but they want proof that somebody else has tried it before. They, they have very low risk tolerance. Right? They want guarantees. What, what, proof, what guarantee will I have that it's going to work? None. <laughs> These people are willing to sacrifice time and energy to be a part of something imperfect. So I got a call from a guy. True story. He heard my name from a, from a small company that I had helped. This was the exact conversation. Convince me why I should hire you. <laughs> he told me he lives here. My answer? Don't. <laughs> I needed the money. I had none. But I knew that I had to only work with these people. So if, the, if you have to force somebody or convince somebody, what are you wasting your breath for? Walk away. Go find somebody who's banging down your door and begging to find their why. Those are the people you want to help. Why would you invest energy with somebody where the impact is going to be minimal at best? And do you have any idea how much work you're going to have to do after they get it? Go help the people who are going to like thank you and like celebrate you, and then they're just going to run off and do great things. It's it's a game of you know you're, it's it's betting. You only have x many hours in the day, and you only have x many days in the year, and you only have x many years in your life. It runs out. So make your choices really carefully. Walk away. Run away. <laughs> Absolutely. Simon, we're out of time, but I wonder if you've got just one last thought for everybody, one last takeaway, the one thing you want us to remember when we go home tonight. And I'm good, we'll be acceptable. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the same advice. I'll, I'll offer the same thing that I, I offer. It goes back to the early days. Ask for help. Life is too difficult to do alone. Building a business is too difficult to do alone. If you think you can do it alone, you're absolutely nuts. Uh, ask for help. We do not build trust when we offer help. We build trust when we ask for it. Ladies and gentlemen, Simon Sinek. Thanks so much. Wow.